Well, it is 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Welcome to Healing Insights from the Book of Psalms. I'm Dr. David DeRose. We're going to be led uh, tonight in our study by uh, Pastor Brian Choi. But uh, before we hand things over to Brian, I'm just going to lead us in a brief word of prayer as we ask for God's guidance. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege you give us of coming together, of studying your word. We thank you that uh, Pastor Brian is uh, willing to lead us on this journey through Psalm 8. We thank you for uh, where you've taken us. And Father, we've um, seen a lot of interest in this group, a lot of people uh, apparently uh, tuning in uh, for the uh, dialogue, but not live. If some should interact with us tonight, in addition to those who've already joined, we pray that you would impress them to join our group. If um, the main uh, reason for our dialogue tonight is not only to bless those who are physically present, whether they're interacting or just tuning in, but also for those who will tune in later, we're thankful for that as well. So please just uh, give us the right discussion group, the right guidance, the blessing that we need and that others will need as they tune in in the future. We thank you that we can trust you to do that, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brian, looking forward to your uh, your insights tonight. Yes, thank you, Pastor DeRose. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's really good to be back again to study the book of Psalms together. Uh, as Pastor David said, we are covering Psalms chapter 8 today. And I'm pretty confident that we're going to uh, finish this psalm today because it's a short psalm, only nine verses, and um, we're going to take time to just go ahead and have a one-time read through this chapter, and then we'll just um, go verse by verse and see what we can observe. Okay, so can we um, have a volunteer read verses one through nine? It shouldn't be too long. Anybody that's willing to read that for us, that'd be appreciated. For you, Pastor Chud. All right, thank you. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is a man that you are mindful of him? and the son of man that you visit him. For you have made a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands, and you have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Okay, amen. All right, thanks for that reading. And so um, as we look through this text, this chapter, what do you guys notice the difference between the other Psalms that we've covered compared to today's Psalm, Psalm chapter eight? How does Psalms chapter eight, um, what do you notice that's uniquely different from the other Psalms that we've covered thus far? Any Any thoughts? It's more of praise than some of the previous psalms. Yeah, absolutely. It's more of a praise than the previous psalms, right? The previous psalms, we see how um, David's crying out to the Lord um, at times. There's other times where he's um, talking about his enemies that are, you know, arrayed against him, um, where God's judgment, and, and as a result of uh, what he's going through, he's thinking that God's judgment is upon him. But in Psalms chapter 8... Um, yes, there's some enemies mentioned, um, but we see that in Psalms chapter 8, the, the focus is primarily upon God and the praises of who God is and God to be admired and God to be in awe of. Um, do you guys notice that? <clears throat> Any other yes. thoughts? Add? Yes. A lot of reverence, you know, to a the Lord, the Creator. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we, we were talking last week, uh, Brian, about how it it almost seems to me as you read through these first, you know, eight psalms, 
that uh, you get this overview in Psalm 1 and 2, and, you know, about God promising prosperity, God being in charge. And then as you get into Psalms 3 through 7, it's, it seems like, well, where's the prosperity? Where is God being in charge? And then, um, you know, after you get kind of this whole range of human experience, kind of, and I, I suggest it's kind of a microcosm of the whole book of Psalms, then we come to Psalm 8, like you said, and it's just this, um, I compared it to Psalm 150 at the end of the Psalms, where you just have this kind of un, unrestrained praise. And we, we get that sense. At least I get it as I read through Psalm 8. It's just praising God, you know, for who he is. Absolutely. Yeah, I see that too. And I noticed that too. And it seems like other people are also in agreement to, with that as well. So uh, what a way to start the Psalm though. In verse one, um, what does it say? It says, it says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above heavens. So um, I know that it says, how excellent is thy what? Thy name. Right. Yeah, other translations, I guess it says, majestic is thy name. Um, means the same thing. Um, but what is uh, David bringing out here? He's saying that the focus is God's name. How excellent is thy name? How majestic is your name in all the earth? So what does name, since this is the focus of David or the psalmist, <clears throat> what is name? What is a name? What is God's name? What, what when it's talking about how majestic is your name, how excellent is thy name, what is the name that David is focusing on? What what about God is in connection to his name? Yeah. <clears throat> Perhaps I see him here as the creator God. God okay. the creator. Yes. Throughout the chapter eight, you see a lot of um References to God as creation. Yes, absolutely. There's a lot of references to his creation. Okay. So that adds to his name excellence. Is that what you're saying, Ursula? That's right. Yeah, that's what, what is um, the psalm is praising um, highly. His mm -hmm. majestic name, his um, powerful name. But of course, also name means um, the name of the Lord. That is it refers to who he is, his character. His character. Exactly. Exactly. So name denotes character. And in this case, the focus is on God's name, which is God's character. Um, if I look at the definition of name in, in the original language, it also says that the name denotes character, fame, and glory of a person. And this is uh, definitely what is being brought out here as the psalmist is focusing on God's name, his character, his fame, his glory. Um, the focus is all on him and, and, and awe as a result of this focus. Okay. And he says that he has set his glory. Where? What did he, what did he set? Uh, his, the he, in the heavens. In the heavens. And so God set his glory in the heavens. Um, what do you guys so, think that? Wouldn't you call him heavenly father? Mm. Yeah, when you call him heavenly father, it kind of, who, who do you look, where do you look to when you call him heavenly father? You look, at, look up to the heavens, right? Yes. That's his abode. That's his place of dwelling. And of course, his his glory is um, seen as we as we look up to him. Yeah. So, um, verse two, it's interesting. Um, it says, "Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings has thou ordained strength, because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger." Okay, so 
this is very interesting. What do you guys gather from verse two? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength. So God, according to this text, he ordained strength out of the mouth of babes and suckling babes, right? So what does this tell you? <laughs> Well, what, where, how is strength found in the most unusual of all places? When you think about strength, you don't really think that strength can be found in the mouth of a babe or a baby. No, but, I love your, I love your emphasis, Brian, because, you know, if you look at, you know, just where we've been already, it's in Psalm 8, verse 1. You know, we're, we're focused on God whose glory in the English standard version um, and then New King James as well. It says you've set your glory above the heavens. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, so you've got this lofty God. And then, like you're saying, then then we have kind of the lowliest. People on the planet mm -hmm. and uh, and he's his praise is being spoken from them. So it's like the whole the whole range of, you know, the the greatness of God. And then how he's seen in the in the smallest and the weakest. Yeah, I appreciate that yeah. that yeah. emphasis. Yeah, it's like a, a vast contrast, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, <clears throat> but does this does is this familiar to you when when it says when the psalmist says, "Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast ordained strength." Um, where else in the Bible do we hear similar language where it talks about out of the mouth of babes, young ones, um, God's strength is being seen? Does, does it ring a bell? Does, is there anywhere in the Bible that also talks about the same thing? Is that in Matthew? Yes, in Matthew. Um, uh, 21. Okay, Matthew 21, verse 16. Is 16, that what you're talking about? Yeah, 21, okay. 16. Okay, now, Matthew 21, 16, as we're turning there, um, you know, this is um, the, the story of Jesus's triumphal entry as he is entering in uh, on a donkey, right? Um, and you guys know the whole story, but with a triumphal entry, Jesus comes in, everyone sees him on this cult, everyone's giving him praise, and they're waving palm branches, and they're putting their clothes on the path of this donkey that Jesus is riding on, um, all hailing him as king. And um, there's a group of people that were not happy about this. Who was not happy? Everybody was happy except for these people. <laughs> Which select group was not happy about this uh, this event? Probably the Pharisees. Yeah, the, the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees, right? When they saw this, they were not happy. And, um, and look at verse 15 of verse 21 of Matthew. Matthew 21, verse 15. It says, and when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. And he said unto them, Jesus speaking to them, here's thou what these say. And Jesus said unto them, yea, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou shalt, thou hast perfect praise. So what is they, what is Jesus quoting from here? Psalm eight, uh, verse two. Yeah, he's mm -hmm. he's quoting Psalms eight, uh, but of course there's a little variation to this because here he says, "Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings that has perfected praise," but in Psalms chapter eight it says, "Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings that has ordained strength." A slight variation, but it essentially means the same thing when you delve into this deeper. Um, so if what Jesus said is true, that out of the mouth of babes and sucklings is perfected praise, 
And the psalmist says, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast ordained strength. Um, what can we gather from this saying? Well, children don't lie. That children that young don't lie. When they say something, it's because they've heard it, they know it. There's I mean, a sincerity to what children say and what children do, right? Yeah. Because, I mean, when my mother passed away, my daughter was in kindergarten. But they had such a close relationship that against everybody in the family, I had to take her. I felt like I had to take her to say goodbye to her grandmother. Mm. And a couple days after the funeral, I heard her outside talking with the neighbor child. And she said, they put my grandma in a jewelry box. Uh. Now, I mean, who's going to look at a casket and say, oh, that's a nice jewelry box? Mm. I mean, that came directly out of my, my daughter's mouth. <laughs> right. They, they just... I was just shocked mm. that. Because they, uh, you know, everybody, oh, she's going to be traumatized, blah, blah, blah. And she thought it was a jewelry box. Mm. Yeah. The, the instant and the, um, the, the sincerity in what children observe and say as a result of that is, it's, um, there, there's no, um, there's no guile in what they say. There's no deceit in what they say. They just, no, uh -uh. Speak it as it is, right? Yeah. Yeah. It and, is, it is, yes. mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, in the same way, I think the psalmist is trying to capture this very thing as well. Mm -hmm. There's something about a child's simple and innocent wonder that mm -hmm. God cherishes as a part of true worship. The truest worship comes from a child's simple and innocent wonder. And and didn't Jesus say that we, too, must become like little children? Yeah. Yes. Um, especially in this sense. Um, we need to have that same simple and innocent wonder and awe of God. And that constitutes truest, the truest worship that God, God wants. And so it's, it's very interesting that uh, the psalmist brings us out in comparison to the enemies. So he, he says, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast ordained strength. And the strength comes from children <laughs> in the face of their enemies. So I don't know about you, but if I'm going to face my enemy, I don't want to look like I'm weak. I don't want to look like I am at a disadvantage or I don't even want to look like a child, helpless. I want to look like I'm big and strong. I want to look <laughs> that I'm a formidable person. Don't mess with me, <laughs> you know, back off, you know? But the psalmist says that out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast ordained strength. Mm -hmm. There is a reference um, in my Bible also to First Corinthians one twenty seven. This is maybe an, another thought for us to ponder in addition, which says God has ordained or has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And mm -hmm. God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. That's right. Amen. Amen. That's exactly what I was trying to get at. Yeah. So God will use in the, in verse two, what I see is that God is saying that he will use the humblest means yes. to confound our enemies. Mm -hmm. enemies. Right. So he'll use the humblest means to confound his enemies. And doesn't the Bible say that um, when I am weak, he is strong, right? Yeah. 
And that's, that's where, that's what we want the strength to be. We don't want the strength in and of ourselves. Our strength is limited. Our strength is not able to overcome all things. And when we understand that, and we understand that when we understand our weakness, our helplessness, our dependence on a mighty God, we will rely upon his strength all the more as little children do. Now, um, little children are not afraid to acknowledge their weakness. You know, um, sometimes my children say, oh, daddy, could you please open this jar for me? Or, you know, um, take this for me or daddy, this is too heavy. And, and they're acknowledging their weakness. Why? Because they're acknowledging that there's one that can help them, even though they're weak. And one that they rely on, even though they're weak. And so yeah, they have also this humbleness and innocence, you know, that that we often we are we are not that humble in in confessing that we are that I am in need. And so yes, that's again, right. there, there needs in you know, for God to be able to use us, we need to surrender. That's right. Humble that humble. That's right. That's right. And um you know, it, it says, in, uh, is, is there any more other thoughts before I go into um, further expounding on this? Any other thoughts? I, I think one thing that's interesting is, you know, again, with the flow of this psalm, you know, I appreciate you making that point at the beginning about God's name, you know, being his character. And some may remember when when Moses wanted to uh, to see God in Exodus 33 and 34. <laughs> It says God passes before him and declares his name. So um, it's it's interesting that that here the one who's declaring God's name, you know, his character. He's the the son of David. You know, is these is these these children. You know, this this uh, this this counterplay between weakness and strength, and it to me it ties in with where we've been in this psalm because you know we start Psalm one. God blessing, you know, promising prosperity to the one who trusts in him. And then it looks like David's very weak. You know, he's going through all kinds of problems. But then here in Psalm 8, the praise to God, the, the pure praise is coming from the, the weak ones. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of, to me, there's this kind of interesting dynamic to the Psalms because it, it kind of surprises us. I mean, it, I mean, we know the Psalms. I mean, we're familiar with it. But if we didn't know the book at all, and you read a book and it's going to talk about the prosperity of the righteous, you'd say, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. And uh, and so there's all these kind of counterintuitive things, but that's how our human experience is. We expect God to work in one way, and he's not working that way. And instead of being discouraged, no, God's working through, through the adversity. God's working through the weak ones. So I, I really, to me, it, spe it encourages me because, you know, in our human vision, uh, you know, human perspective, it's easy to be discouraged by all these things. But like you said, it's it's helping us point to the God who is the one who's excellent, who's above the heavens, even though we're weak. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and I, I appreciate you bringing that out, Pastor DeRose, because uh, I don't know about you, but when I look at Psalms chapter eight and we just kind of read through it, there's something that kind of shows like an inner strength that the psalmist has as he is praising God <laughs> in this way. You know, there, there seems to be an inner strength within someone that just praises God in the face of, you know, whatever they're going through. Um, that's something, like you said, counterintuitive. You're, that's not something that we normally would do. That's not our gut instinctive reaction to do. But when you are, are praising God and that is your, your, reaction to the adversity that you're experiencing there there's some sort of strength that is seen in that even though you you may be strong i mean you yourself may be weak there seems to be an inner strength in that when you're relying upon a bigger power other than yourself which is in this case god so that that's that's pretty um interesting and i, I don't know about you but that's what i get when i look through psalms chapter eight Amen. There, there's a strength that seems to kind of come out as the psalmist dwells upon God and his goodness and his power and, and his might. And um, that's something that just kind of, you know, speaks to me in a way uh, that we should take to heart. But. Um, and um, 
as you said it, it I I sensed that David truly show, made it his choice to praise the Lord and not ponder any longer what was in the past or what what has been on his way, but it's a choice. And uh, the I do have to daily in in um, even considering the darkness and gross darkness that is described that's going about us um, and the, the personal experiences. Um, we have to pray, take time to praise the Lord because the, he is praiseworthy. His name is great. He's done grand things for us. Mm. Um, has brought us to this moment, right? And that's what I'm hearing from David, okay? Um, he, he is, and then I can just envision him laying out there and looking in the heavens and like, and he just has no words, no no breath to express what he what he's experiencing there, and he's just getting, you know, more ravished in in, in choosing words to praise the Lord. It's mm -hmm. really beautiful. It is it is yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yes. Any other thoughts? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, Janice. Hi. Yes, um, I've always felt that what Ursula was saying about Psalms, that there's so many places through many of the Psalms where David, you know, is lamenting. He is mentioning, naming difficulties and trials and, and things, burdens he has, but he always follows it up with praise. Mm -hmm. And, but I'm in Lord, my, I'm in the Lord's hands and I've actually felt that I try to do that as often as I can. It's kind of like, this is really like a health message for us because when we're praising, mm -hmm. we're doing positive things in our physiological body. I think is what you'd call it that I heard a, a uh, heart specialist. He's an administ older guy. I cannot remember his name, but an, a lot of years ago, how just, the very act of praising, even as soon as you can, even after adversity or trial or horrible things happening in your life to begin praising, because that sends positive something coursing through your body to, to help ward off the disease. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's true. There's there's So there's a aspect of health here as well. Yeah, we can... I hear that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I have a question for you guys, and this is something that, um, I'm, I want to get your thoughts on. Um, it talks about, it says, um, because of thine enemies that thou might, might have still the enemy and the Avenger. So there's, there's, there's an enemy that is being mentioned here. Who is that enemy? But well, one thing we notice is that enemy of ours is also God's enemy. So I find that really interesting. Do you guys see that? That yeah. enemy is also God's enemy. His enemy is our enemy, right? Correct. Because it, it said, because of thine enemies, speaking of God, right? His enemies, and thou might still the enemy. And so if we're truly God's, his enemies are our enemies, and um, and also it says the avenger. What is the avenger? That I find that word very interesting because what does that kind of imply? There's an avenger that is against you. What is an avenger? Or you guys have different translations. What does it say instead of avenger? Does it say something different? Mm -hmm. That's what mine says. Yes. Yes. Same word in the New Kings. Okay. So what is an Avenger? I would I would have to go to the dictionary. So please tell me what it's going to mean. I guess I always well, kind of consider an Avenger as someone who would right a wrong for you. But maybe okay. I'm wrong. Okay. Right or wrong, okay. So, but this is not right or wrong for us. No. 
it, they're actually trying to avenge against us. Do you see? Yeah. So that's that's the question I have. Like, why would they? What did we do to, you know, want someone to have some revenge against us? The spirit of revenge or getting something back from us. Um, it would only be the devil is the only one that. <laughs> that's exactly right. You know, some commentators come to that same conclusion, Janice. They say that the avenger is the enemy of souls, the devil himself. It's the same, the same one for us, right? Today, he's the, the, the enemy of us all. And yeah, yeah. So we have enemy, like literal enemies, but we also have spiritual enemies. Enemies, yes. That are arrayed against us, that seek, that seek to avenge against us. But it says that it is through the mouth of babes that God ordains strength and thereby stills the enemies. Somebody read it earlier. It says silence the enemies. And that's you have know, Revelation where it talks about the devil being the accuser of the brethren. He accuses them before God day and night. Right? Yeah. Reading the clear word, it says the great expense of the heaven reveals your mighty power and silences your enemies. Mm -hmm. Wow, I like that. I like that. So that, that just kind of brings out a bigger picture of this great controversy, right? This great yes. controversy where um, Christ is, God is overseeing all things. God is reigning over all things, despite this clash between our enemies and, and both literal and spiritual. God is overseeing all as we, um, and, and we acknowledge his strength, um, as we as we praise him and acknowledge our weakness and acknowledge that he is the one that is our source of strength. So, so Pastor Brian, so Pastor Brian, you got you know, you got me going here because okay. um no, I I'm I'm looking at the you know at the Hebrew too. I mean it's exactly uh the in the lexicon, you know, it talks about one, the avenger, one who, you know, takes vengeance, one who entertains revengeful feelings. Mm -hmm. Um you know, that has the idea of revenge. And so, so, you know, you got me asking the question because I hadn't really thought about that. I mean, it, what does Satan feel that we've done to him? Mm. In other words, that he's getting revenge. And I, I thought that was kind of where you were going or am I going too far with it? No, 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 please. It's, it's, it further expound. Oh. No, well, I, I mean, so, and like I said, I hadn't really, uh, I hadn't really thought about that, that word in that context. And um, I mean, like you said, I know we're in a, you know, the Bible speaks of it, you know, sometimes described as a great controversy. I mean, it's a, it's a battle, you know, we're wrestling not against flesh and blood, mm -hmm. Paul says. So I guess we could look at technically anything that exalts God, anything yes. that makes God look good, um, you know, Satan doesn't like. He has a problem. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. So if if David, you know, David was a man after the Lord's heart, he was reflecting God's character. He was reflecting His name. Mm -hmm. um, is that what you know Satan is angry about? But I'm I, I'm I'm asking the question as well because I haven't really I haven't really wrestled with that word before. I don't. Know, what do you think? I, I think very well it could be. You know, that's I, I think the devil. Um, he he doesn't he doesn't uh, he has a problem with God. He has a problem with his law. He has a problem with his government, right? He even tried to usurp the throne. Um, but now, since he's cast out of heaven, the only thing that he can do is to actually, since he can't, you know, assault God because he's so powerful, he, what does he do? He he sets his sights on us, mm. right? As, as a means to try to, you know, get revenge against God. And so how, how do you hurt somebody the most? If you can't touch that person, you touch their children, right? And so, you know, but we as God's children, when we rely upon the God that we serve, knowing that he's all powerful, knowing that he's going to bring all things to, to justice and, and all things to an end, and, um, and he will reign forever and ever, you know, that, that's reason to praise him. And he will also bring us those victories against the enemy, um, even while we're here on this earth, as this this struggle continues between, you know, good, bec between God's children and and the enemies of both God and His children. And so I think it is very very true that um, 
I thank you, Pastor David, for bringing that out because that is um, exactly what I believe this text is bringing out. And so, um, well, any yeah. other? It's yes. talking about children, and you know, a mother will do anything to protect her children. Mm -hmm. And I think God would do anything to protect his children. Absolutely. Also, he did. And mm -hmm. so his enemy silenced them would be the devil. That's right. Because he is attacking God's children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. And so, you know, there's there's a lot there in verse two that um, we can explore deeper. Right. But um, yeah. there, there, I just I see the great controversy there um, and I see how we can overcome in that great controversy that we overcome in this in his strength. Right. The strength that he has ordained uh, out of our praise to him. Um, moving on. Um, One thing comes to mind, and maybe this is a way of thinking, but um, I also see there that David is really clear on that. You, O oh God, you, O oh Lord, that he is praising here. Yes. You are the one that's going to eventually, uh, you have ways, you have, of which we don't know anything that this side, this enemy of all of us will eventually be eradicated and no longer. I mean, so there's the plan of salvation in there as well. So yeah, not just- Can a, you see that? Or? Yes, but a plan of salvation ultimately at the end that God has in store for all of us. Yeah, absolutely. Which is all the more reason to praise him even more. So yes, very good. Thank you, Ursula. Okay, now verse three, when I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained. What is David talking about? What is he setting his focus on now? He's considering. He's awed by what the Lord has done. What the Lord has done. What What did he do? Or what is David's focus in verse three of what God the has done? The moon and the stars. The moon and the stars. Um which thou hast ordained, the work of thy fingers. Okay, so um, <clears throat> what is he alluding this to? He's probably week. <laughs> lying on the ground looking up into the sky. Okay, <laughs> yeah. He's looking at the sky. Um, and he's actually, of, go ahead. All of creation, maybe. All of creation, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. He's, he's focusing on God's creative power. He's focusing, focusing at the end product of what he has created, right? And in verse 3, in this case, he's focusing on the heavens, the moon, and the stars. Um, question for you. What day did God create the moon and stars and sun? The fourth day. That's what the fourth, day. Day. Fourth, the fourth day. day. Now, it's interesting because the reason why I asked that question is because all throughout this chapter, he specifically mentions the things that God created. And you're going to kind of see glimpses of what God has made on the creation week, right? Verse three, he's focusing primarily on the, the heavens and the moon and the stars, which was actually created on the fourth day, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so it is interesting that uh, how did God create all things? He spoke them in. And it became mm -hmm. by the word. He of pretty mouth. much said it and he it just, appeared. He spoke it and it appeared, right? Yes. Right. So with the, with the exception of man. With the exception of man. Yes. yes. <laughs> right. Now, now, the question I have is this, you know, if God spoke all things into existence, why is the psalmist saying, when I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, wait a minute, I thought God spoke things into existence. Did he fashion? Well, with the stars, he might have 
like pointed to each one as they come up. Okay. Okay. Um, so, so how do we make sense of this? Because in Genesis chapter one, he spoke things into existence, but then it, and the psalmist says that God, he made them with his hands, the work of his fingers. Okay, you got me at a disadvantage here. I'm in two Bibles. <laughs> here? Okay. Okay. And and I'm just throwing this out there for discussion sake. Um, you no. Know, and if you actually look at Genesis chapter one, it's interesting. Um, there are verses in the Bible that says that God spoke things, and then it says that he made things. Mm -hmm. okay and so it says both this it says that he spoke things and he made things and um and and like pastor DeRose said god did form man out of the ground right he actually formed it fashioned man from the dust mm -hmm. of the earth mm -hmm. we know that but also it seems to imply if you look at um other places like on day two on day two in genesis chapter one verse seven it says that he made the firmament after after saying, let there be firmament. He says, let there be firmament in verse six. But then in verse seven, it says he made the firmament. And with that word made in the original Hebrew, that word made means fashioned. Fashioned. Mm -hmm. And so um, same thing in, in, in day four, uh, Genesis 1, 16 says he he made or he fashioned or produced two great lights, one that rules by day, one that rules by night. Um, so again, he uses that word made, fashioned. Okay. Now, and of course, when he made man, he, he fashioned him as well. So is it meaning that God, did he speak things into existence or did he make things? Or did he do both? both he did both yeah okay all right so um you know i don't know if it's both i can't say that for certain but i can see what the psalmist is saying here based on what the psalmist is saying here he's saying his spoken word that brought all things to existence his spoken word and that brought things to existence and the end product of what he created is so intric intricately designed and so meticulously fashioned that it is almost as if it, it, is, is, it was crafted with his fingers and hands. Um, when you see what God created, it testifies to the skill, the divine intelligence, and the wisdom and how everything was crafted as if he fashioned it with his own hands. Um, I, I, that's, I kind of feel that the psalmist is kind of like, you know, bringing to mind something that describes what only we as humans can understand. When we make something, we fashion things with our hands, right? But with God, he spoke things to existence, but as things came to be, it almost seems that it feels like also a skillful design as if God's own hands created it. So I'm thinking it could be it could be either or. I don't know. We'll get the, when we get to heaven, we'll see. <laughs> I don't know for certain. I can't say for sure that it's either or, but I thought that was interesting when you look it at goes. their it goes, right? Don't you wouldn't you agree that he, he used both his voice, his book, he called into existence mm -hmm. and, and he said to let the waters do this and that and Right. So and then of course the forming of man with his own hands out of dust. So he he did both. Yeah, yeah. In his, in his mind, in creative mind of God, he he created absolutely uh, dust. Yeah. Spoke into existence. Yeah. Absolutely clear evidence that he did both, um, based on what we see in the whole Bible narrative. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. So, um. And as um, Pastor DeRose said earlier, you know, we see God and the loftiness of God, his dwellings in the heavens, 
right? And and that's where the psalmist is focusing on in verse three. You know, he's seeing all the the wonders of heaven um, that is you know hung out there in the vast expanse of the of the heavens. And verse four, he suddenly realizes his smallness in comparison to all that vastness. In verse four, he says, "What is man?" that thou art mindful of him and the son of man, that thou visitest him. Okay. So he's, he's saying he he's realizing his smallness compares to all of God's great creation. Right. And he says, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Mm-hmm. Now, now stop right there. Let's just take that part. What he said, what is man that thou art mindful of him? What is man that you concern yourself? That you concern yourself over him. Yeah, exactly. What is man? Man seems so insignificant compared to all of the things that God has created, right? Yes. What is man that you would consider him or remember him, right? And the son of man that thou visitest him. Now that word visitest, what does it say in other translations? Uh, what value is he that you continue to care for him? You continue to care for him. Um, that's that's good. It's also, a yeah. if you look at the uh, the the definition of visitist in the King James version, that word also means attend to or to seek after. So, <laughs> it's like, what is man that what is man God that you'd consider him? And that you continue to seek after him. Yeah. Right? Like, why would, like, who are we that God, that that makes us worthy for God to give us this consideration? For right. him to come after us, right? Mm-hmm. To be so mindful of us, you know, yeah. when we can easily be lost in all of his vast creation. It is right? the love of God, no? Yeah. Love of God only could um, keep on seeking and nurturing and mm. and being mindful of uh, of us of me every day. Yes, right. It That's right. Such a privilege. Absolutely. This to be remembered, to be this, remembered by. Yes. By this verse should bring us great comfort. Because how many of us have ever felt that sometimes we are insignificant to God or that God passes us by? Mm-hmm. Um, there's even a hymn that says, pass me not, O gentle Savior, um, while on others thou art calling, do not pass me by, right? It's like you, you feel that God is so busy with so many important things in not just the universe, but yet alone and there's more important things to attend to in this earth. Mm-hmm. It's easy for him to just... It's easy to think that God will overlook us. But according to this verse, he doesn't overlook us. He's very mindful of us. He's very um, attentive to us. He's seeking after us. He's aware. He's well aware of us um, as an individual, as if we're the only person on earth. And, and the psalmist expresses this wonder of God's wonderful works but how it pales in comparison to who he is. But nevertheless, God sees him as a, he sees all of us as of infinite worth. Is that encouraging? Very. Amen. It's giving himself to us. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's very encouraging. And I think we need to be reminded of that. Right. Um, because it's very easy for us to think that God is so distant. God is, probably overlooking me but that couldn't be furthest from the truth right mm-hmm. god very much promises, yeah his his word the promises over and over again i'm i'm with you you belong to me i'm your god that's right don't worry fear not i'm with you i'm holding you up so that's very personal mm-hmm. god right very personal and that per- what being a new Christian, sometimes I feel as if he's forgotten about me. Mm-hmm. You know, here I am 
I've given yeah. you my heart, my soul. Um, I've given you everything. I've given up a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And now you've just forgotten me. And that's, that's right. not true, but that's how you feel sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's the enemy. <laughs> so yeah. um, that that's true. That, yes, Rita, that's the enemy, you know, that's putting the thoughts here out. It, that's right. So um, that is a good verse to remember. Absolutely. Absolutely. I wholeheartedly. At, at that time. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And um, the, the psalmist continues with this thought about who are we, God, that you would be mindful of us and that you'd visit us. Verse five, or you have made him a little lower than the angels and has crowned him with glory and honor. Now, it's interesting. Verse five, you know, it's, it reads literally in our English Bibles, for thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. Okay, but in, did you know that in the original Hebrew, it does not say, it's not translated as angels. In place of angels, the actual word is Elohim. Elohim. And who's, what's Elohim? It's God. It's God. Right? Mm -hmm. So ne nowhere in the Bible is Elohim addressed or signifying angel. Nowhere. Okay, if you look at the original text in the Hebrew, this actually reads, for thou hast made him a little lower than God and crowned him with glory and honors. That's how it's read. The reason why we angels, though, is because Paul used that word. If you look at the, the quote that he did in Hebrews chapter two, where he uses the same quotation about speaking of Christ's incarnation. It says you have made him a little lower than the angels. Um, and that word is actually angels in the in the New Testament Greek, angelos. But in the Hebrew, it's actually Elohim. So this is actually saying you have made him a little lower than God, right? And of course, you know another Psalm David says that uh, we are we are all gods, little g, because you know we're his children, right? So this is just signifying the fact that. God is above us, just like the psalm says in the beginning, right, of this of chapter 8. He's above us, and we're lower than him, right? And although we're lower than him in comparison to God, God crowns us with glory and honor. Who is God? That, who are we that God would do that for us? No? Like, we're, we're below him. We're beneath him. Yet he crowns us with glory and honor. And... Um, of course, later on, this same text is being used to talk about Christ. Christ, who is higher than the angels, in Hebrews chapter 1 and 2, it talks about that. And then we are made lower than the angels. And then Christ had to go two levels down from where he was at, being divine and all-powerful. He went down, not just the notch or the level of the angels, but he went down below, like two two levels demoted, right? <laughs> to to get down to our level. Yet despite this demotion, uh, Christ at the very end, as he humbled himself, he was crowned with glory and honor. And this is spoken of in Philippians chapter two, uh, verse five through 11, where it talks about how how low Christ went how he, his willingness to demote himself to the lowest degree, even unto death, even the death of the cross. And then in verse 9 of Philippians 2 says that um, God therefore highly exalted him and given him a name above every other name, which is also his excellent name, right? That spoke of here. And then crowning him with glory and honor. And we see that Christ was crowned with glory and honor so that he can crown us with glory and honor at the end. And we see that um, all throughout um, the end of Revelation where there's an end of sin. God um, recreates a new heavens and a new earth. We are recreated and restored into the image of God. And we're crowned with glory and honor. 
And as we're crowned with glory and honor. For his glory, right? Yeah. And, and, and what do we, what will we testify of? And um, I'd like to just direct you to um, Revelation chapter 19, verse 1. This is after the end of sin. And this is, um, we're, we're just going to read these three verses and we'll close because we're out of time. But um, Revelation chapter 19, verse 1. Can someone read that for us, please? After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord of our God. Mm. So again, what are they praising God for? Salvation, glory, honor, and honor. power unto the Lord our God. So at the very end, when all things are taken care of, the end of sin, great controversy is ended, we testify to God's glory and honor and his salvation that he has uh, secured for us, right? And then yeah. furthermore, Revelation chapter 21, verse 24. Can someone read that for us, please? Revelation 21, 24. What will we be doing in the, the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Okay, so in the city, there will be those who will bring their glory and honor into it. So God crowns the glory and honor. We bring the glory and honor to God into that city that we dwell in. Um, read verse 26 as well. Uh, and please. they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. Mm. So do you see what is happening here? You know, although we are lowly, frail, sin-tainted creations, defective, we are highly valued by God. And he has an ultimate plan for your life that extends to eternity. So who are we that God would regard us so? And doesn't the Bible say we love him because he first loved us? Mm -hmm. And because of that love, he created us, he redeemed us, he sanctifies us at last, and that very last he will crown us with glory and honor. So we could bring that glory and honor for all eternity to him, testifying throughout eternity that God is love. And um the Psalm chapter eight, it speaks about all the works of his hands that he's created. And it says also, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. So it begins with claiming how God's name is excellent in the beginning of the psalm and at the end. It is sandwiched there, testifying to God's great name. What is his name? His character. And his character must be vindicated at the very end. Uh, when the great controversy is finally uh, brought to a resolution. Mm -hmm. so, um, this is definitely a little, you know, summary of all that God is to us and what he will do for us. And um, I, I really appreciated the study because there's a lot of things here that we saw um, as we delved in that alludes to the great controversy, alludes to God's plan for us, how God regards us, God's love for us. Um, definitely a psalm worth studying and looking into again and again. So any other thoughts before we wrap this up? Any quick thoughts? Okay. I mean, to me, it just reminds us that we need to give the glory to the Lord. Amen. Amen. Yes, he exactly. He gives us glory, but we need to give him the glory first. Amen. And what are we going to do when we get our crowns in heaven? Yes. We're going to we're going to cast our give him <laughs> Exactly. We're going to we're going to give him that glory and honor because it was because of him 
that we made it and yes. we can be glory and honor because of that. So that is true. All right. Well, we are out of time, uh, right at the nine o'clock mark. And so we'll close with a word of prayer and then we'll then transition to our prayer time. And if you have more things to discuss about this chapter, uh, there's still time for that. And so uh, let's just close with a word of prayer as we close out this session of our study together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we have seen the wonder of who you are through this praise of this psalm, your creative power, your mighty works, and how you regard us as your dear children. Um, who are we that you would give us such regard? Yeah. But Lord, uh, we are so grateful that um, we are, it, it just overwhelms us with joy knowing that you regard us as such, as your children. And Lord, it humbles us, but also it brings us a true, um, true self-worth, knowing who we are and why we exist in this world and for the world to come. The plans you have for us are good plans. Help us to trust you and um, be with us, Lord, as we continue to um, praise you and to draw closer to you in our daily walk. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.